You know how Simone Biles is being either lionized or demonized right now for backing out of the team gymnastics and individual all around finals at the Tokyo Olympics? People are either celebrating her as the great example for black women and girls, especially on how not to be a work martyr, how to put your mental health before anything else, how to prioritize yourself, how to learn the power of saying no without guilt. Or people are excoriating her and are saying things that honestly don't deserve repeating because these people can probably barely walk a straight line on hot asphalt in the summer, let alone land any of the routines that Biles conquers. But the interesting thing about this conversation about black women taking a cue from Biles and not putting the goals of the collective before our individual physical and mental health is that this is not only a serious issue among black and poor people in general, but for different reasons, but it's also a very real issue among us radical organizers. And I actually started thinking about this last night after I was reflecting on Glenn Ford's passing. But first, let me make it clear that women, poor people, black people in particular, always have to decide whether we will ignore the physical pain we're feeling and just get up and go to work or not. Usually because we are disproportionately poor and can't afford not to work, we decide to tough it out. We disproportionately don't have health insurance. And if we do, we can't afford the co-pays. If we have pretty good health insurance and the co-pays aren't terrible, then we're afraid to take time off work to go to the doctor because those pains usually mean we are sick or injured. And too often it's serious because we don't want to run the risk of the security of our job or losing our job. We're so afraid that our coworkers and bosses will decide that us taking time to take care of our bodies ourselves is actually us being lazy and that we're not team players, that we ignore our physical health to avoid that. And not just physical health either, because imagine working in a work environment where there's racism, sexism, ableism, ageism, managers and coworkers who create a hostile work environment, pressure to work overtime or work weekends or else you're seen as lazy and unambitious. You're passed over for, for promotions. You're not given raises because you stand up for yourself or you don't appear compliant enough for everyone in the office. One person's complaint to management can tank your annual performance review. And let's talk about the pressure of having to endure annual performance reviews anyway. That stuff is garbage. Deadlines and micromanaging and office politics and you'd love to take a vacation. You have vacation days, but if you take them, you're seen as lazy and unmotivated. You don't want to lose your job, so you don't take a vacation or you take a short one, a long weekend. And if that isn't the case and you do take a vacation, how much money do most of us have to go somewhere really nice for more than a week and really just relax? Very, very few. And that's just in the regular world, right? The corporate blue collar service industry work world, the pressures for working class and poor people, women and oppressed people of color are all the same across the board. But you know where this dynamic also exists? Believe it or not, in radical organizing circles. Now, I've been in that corporate world that I just described, and, and I absolutely hate it. it it's, it's awful. It's a capitalist death trap that the strong actually don't survive. I don't care what they say. The filthy rich survive. And they do it by making everyone else rats in a maze. And as busy as Abdus and I had come to be when we were organizing, I would not in my life trade what we do for anything in the world. Like Sean said yesterday, I do this for free but I'm fortunate to get paid to do some of it now. But for us radical organizers, the pressure is still the same, but the reasons for the pressure are different. It's an existential pressure that comes from us knowing that this work we do is truly for real about life and death. We do this work for our life and for the death of this capitalist system that crushes us all. So we organizers also work through physical pain. I've done it plenty of times. We do it all the time, y'all, ignoring backaches and knee pain and having sleepless nights and constant headaches. 
pushing our bodies to physical limits we probably aren't even thinking of because the work we're doing is so important. Staying up late to make flyers, write articles, produce placards for protests, materials for political education, organizing teach-ins, coordinating mutual aid and other relief efforts, constantly reading the news from around the world, communicating with comrades to strategize, educate, organize, 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 skipping meals, not eating good food when we do eat, not sleeping enough because there's so much work to be done, working every single day of the week, traveling, constantly traveling from city to city to support comrades elsewhere in cars, trains, planes, some of us going from country to country. The constant Zoom meetings and interviews when a crisis happens like Haiti or Cuba, the endless responses to the endless imperialist propaganda about these issues, skipping routine physical checkups, not going to the doctor. When we do experience pain, discomfort, changes in our bodies that we know we should get checked out, but there are no health insurance plans for organizers. Sean and I are fortunate. We are paid to do this. So many of our people are not. So they have to work in the capitalist system to live. And what do most of us do with the money we make from our day jobs? We put it right back into organizing. We don't go on vacation because we're organizing. We get time off from our day jobs and we use it to what? Organize. The mental stress of knowing what this system and those who control and benefit from it have done and are doing, especially to our people. Most of us can't afford therapy, but that's heavy, can't afford mental health support, can't afford substance abuse treatment, can't afford grief counseling. And then we get arrested at a protest, can't afford bail, can't afford attorneys to defend us under constant attacks by the entire system that we are fighting like hell to defeat. This made me think of people like Kevin Zeese and Glenn Ford and Bruce Dixon. And yes, my own husband, Always willing to say yes when someone asks, can you speak here? Always at a rally or protest, always responding to the latest imperialist violation, putting their whole lives and beings in service to the people. And it makes me hate that we live in a society where we have to sacrifice our physical and mental health to earn a living in the first place. And then it makes me wish that we didn't have to sacrifice our physical and mental health to fight that system. It's the revolutionaries catch 22. So just like working class and poor and oppressed people in the capitalist work rat race, we revolutionaries don't have the luxury of choosing not to make this sacrifice like Simone Biles did, because we literally cannot afford to so many of us or for us radicals, we choose not to. Because not fighting this system is to concede death for all of us. Just suffer and die quietly like they want us to. And we know too much to give them that. But I want us to remember that we deserve to live a little bit too, y'all. We deserve to take care of our bodies and our minds and each other. Not, Not just we deserve to, we need to, we have to while we fight because we are the only ones who will. We're all we got. So comrades, let's keep fighting like Glenn and others taught us. But let's also remember to do our absolute best to live right Follow Luke Mon Nation on Patreon.com slash Luke Mon Nation for lots of great content.